thinks that gassing up your car with corn ethanol is better for the environment than gasoline? Come on, show me your hands. Any ethanol supporters here? I mean, it's made from corn, so it should be better, right? Well, here's the catch. When you factor in the environmental cost of converting land to grow all that corn, ethanol can actually generate 25% more carbon emissions than gasoline. Turning more land into cornfields has side effects, like clearing forests, disrupting soils, and using tons of fertilizer, all of which add to emissions. And there is more. The push for ethanol can drive up corn prices, making food like cornmeal or even popcorn more expensive. So while ethanol sounds green, the reality is much more complicated. I am a sustainability researcher, passionate about uncovering the real environmental impacts of the products and technologies shaping our lives and our future. Going green is a straight path. For a product to be environmentally sustainable across its whole life cycle, it needs to use fewer or renewable resources. It must be safe for the environment and for us when it's no longer useful. And most importantly, it needs to clearly improve over what we're doing now or even over doing nothing at all. Let's consider some green technologies. Some of these new ideas may sound very promising on paper, but when we roll them out at scale, they may not always perform as expected. Take corn ethanol, for example. It promised to cut emissions, but ended up increasing them. Or what about plastics made from crops, like compostable coffee cups or grocery bags? Sure, these have lower carbon footprint compared to petroleum-based alternatives. But producing enough to replace all the packaging we need would require over half the world's corn supply and more water than all of Europe uses in a year. Great intentions, but unintended consequences. Going green is not as easy as some headlines make it to be, but for me, it's still worth pursuing. Real progress requires looking deeper, beyond the hype, beyond the feel-good assumption that anything plant-based is automatically green. It's about asking the right questions before we scale a solution. So what if we had a framework with key questions that we could ask to assess these new technologies and cut through the noise? Questions that could tell us if a product is indeed environmentally sustainable. These questions exist and are the guiding principles driving my research in my lab at Georgia Tech. And you can use them too to navigate your everyday decisions. So next time you want to evaluate the latest green media darling, the first thing to consider is, what does it take to make and use this thing? How much water, land, energy, raw materials? Are we diverting resources from essentials, like, say, food? Or are we setting ourselves up for the next big environmental stress point? The second thing we need to take into account is what happens after this thing is used. How is it disposed of? Does it break down safely? Or does it create long-term issues with waste or toxicity? Disposal matters. Imagine if every time you took out your trash, you had to think, is this going to destroy a coral reef somewhere? Thinking ahead to a product's end of life, it's crucial to avoid nasty surprises further down the road. And finally, Question number three concerns alternatives. Is the solution better than the status quo? Or even better than doing nothing? Spoiler, there is no perfect solution. Every choice has trade-offs. It's like choosing between hitting snooze one more time or actually getting out of bed. One gives you more sleep, the other gets you to work on time. But you can't have both. So these three questions together form a guiding framework toward achieving green products and technologies. This framework requires us to consider the environmental impacts across the full life cycle of a product as we innovate, iterate, and integrate. Let's use the electric vehicles, the EVs, as an example to illustrate this framework. 
The technologies underpinning EVs have come a long way in 30 years. Production and use of batteries will always issue with EVs. 30 years ago, batteries were very energy intensive to produce, and they were far less efficient. In fact, in the 90s, to drive an EV for one mile, you would need the same energy as to heat a one-bedroom apartment for 15 minutes. In the 90s, EVs also used lead-acid batteries, sparking debates over their adoption. Some said, hold up, this can lead to more lead pollution. Others argued, let's move on and improve as we go. Luckily for EV fans, the second argument prevailed. Scientists and manufacturers innovated and replaced all their chemistries with more advanced ones. Today, EVs are lighter, cleaner, and far more efficient, requiring less than half the energy per mile than the early models. And the grid that we use to power them is getting cleaner too, as it relies more and more on renewables, like wind or solar power. But what about the disposal of EV batteries? Back in the day, recycling options for old batteries were limited, and there were serious challenges with waste and toxicity. But things are improving. New recycling technologies are emerging, making it possible to recover valuable materials from old batteries, like lithium, and give them a new life. These efforts are cutting down on waste, reducing the need to dig up more resources, and bringing us closer to a more circular way for producing batteries. Of course, there is still progress to be made, but we're getting there. And here is where it gets even cooler. Some companies are finding new ways to repurpose old batteries. These old batteries are given a second life as they are being adapted for stationary energy storage, powering things like streetlights, stadiums, or even storing wind or solar energy for homes and grids. Let's compare the EVs to the business-as-usual scenario of gas or diesel-powered cars. So EVs generate no tailpipe emission. Their emissions come from their manufacturing and from the production of the electricity we use to power them. Manufacturing an EV can generate up to 80% more carbon emissions than making a conventional car. And this is mostly due to the mining and processing of the critical materials used in batteries. However, once on the road, EVs tell a different story. The on-road emissions of EVs depend only on the how electricity we use to power the ener them. The energy, the electricity. In places like Norway, where hydropower dominates, EVs have a tiny carbon footprint. In coal-heavy regions, on the other hand, numbers are less impressive, but are still comparable to or even lower than those of conventional cars. And the carbon footprint of EV charging is getting lower too, as we transition more and more to renewables. So that's a huge step forward for the climate. But aside from these global climate-related benefits, EVs can also bring major local benefits. Because they don't generate tailpipe emissions, they don't release pollutants like nitrogen oxides and particulate matter both of which are linked to heart and respiratory issues. So in cities struggling with smog and poor air quality, EVs are not just cleaner for the planet, they are healthier for all of us. EVs' 30-year overnight success is a proof that lasting change requires the alignment of diverse groups, like the policymakers who set the regulatory framework the automotive, the battery, the electronics, and other industries together with the academia and the scientists who innovated and iterated tirelessly. The legal entities who ensured compliance and clarity. The investors who believed in the long-term vision. And of course, the consumers who embraced the change. It's a story of a collective commitment where patience and investment converged to bring innovation and integration. What if we apply this framework to other early-stage technologies, like sustainable aviation fuels, marine biofuels, biodegradable plastics made from bacteria? All these are prototypes of today, just as EVs were that of the 90s. If this framework is adopted early on by all the involved stakeholders, it can bring this alignment and enable these technologies to become mainstream solutions even faster
The path to sustainability is not easy, but it's possible. And it definitely requires to align our efforts across the value chain. By asking these tricky questions about production, end of life, and alternatives, we can transition ambitious green ideas to tangible, enduring solutions. I will leave you with this plea. Let's we, as the TEDx community, embrace this framework and champion its principles. Because the future is not something we wait for. It's something we build together. Thank you.